hello, hello. Great, hi, I'm Josh. I'm going to be uh, <coughs> demonstrating a new framework. This one is so new I just wrote it while Chris was giving his demonstration. So you'll be the first to see it. No, I'm kidding, that's not what I'm doing. If I can just find the cable. Okay. So I am going to be talking about, comes off the screen. I'm talking about ES7. <coughs> and I know that the, uh, the, the, what's that font? This yeah. one is uh, Sketch Rockwell. I was going to make that show. One of my favorite fonts, this one. <coughs> Personal favorite of all time, Go, going way back. And uh, I'm talking about ES7 because ES6 is so last month. What's that font? <coughs> that one is um, Amatic. Um, you'll find it on Google. Amazing font. <laughs> Love that one. One of my second favorite of all time. So look, a little bit about myself, I'm Joshua Wolf, uh, also known as Josh Wolf, at Cetapati on Twitter. Um, I was a famous full stack overflow developer in the 90s. I created a very successful software career, cutting and pasting code out of stack overflow. Up until the lawsuit, nothing was ever proven in court, but part of the uh, settlement agreement was that I couldn't talk about it and I could never code again commercially. So I turn to open source software development and uh, these days to pay the rent I work as a legendary recruiter at Just Digital People. So um, I'm always hiring, hit me up if you're looking for something next in your career. And I've also branched out recently into reality show production. I'm now producing JDP The Internship, uh, which is, follows the fortunes of two final year university students who are doing their industry placement at Just Digital People. One of them is David Farrow, the um, software developer. The other one is Joy Core, the business analyst. 60% of their final year mark relies on me as their industry supervisor. So uh, a lot of tension and drama in there, entertainment, broadcast live on the internet. So if you want to find out about that, follow me on Twitter. It's uh, my pinned tweet at the moment, at Cedar Putty. So, yeah, look, I want to talk a bit about ES7, and this was a special request from Ash. We were sitting in a cafe the other day, or a pub actually, um, over a few brews, having a discussion around ES6 uh, with Corey and Maurice. And so, um, you know, I don't really know much about anything. Is that coming up on the screen? Yeah, before you shaved, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> that's actually, um, I think, Corey before he shaved, and, and Maurice. <laughs> I think Corey's the one with no shoes on. <clears throat> um, I don't really understand what I'm talking about, so all I did for this presentation is copy a whole lot of stuff out of Twitter. Um, so look, there's been a lot of talk about different frameworks, about choosing different frameworks tonight, and this was basically, this is me summarizing Corey, Corey's position on the night. I don't need React or Angular, I can build my own Vanilla JS just fine, thanks. Two weeks later, boom, out it comes. That's <laughs> perfect. Yeah. So, uh, look, I was hoping that Corey could come tonight so we could get our copies of Heritage ES3 coding uh, book signed by him, but he, uh, he's not here. Uh, doing, it by, doing it by hand. So here was someone's response. Yes, if you actually know how to write JavaScript, you don't need libs. And of course, you know, Angular is more of a framework than a library, but it's you know, basically the same thing. If you know how to write JavaScript, you don't need a framework, you don't need library. You know, real men, real women code with no JS. <clears throat> That's Node.js, not Node.js. <laughs> That's so wrong, this is me. Libs and frameworks are not about hiding the fact that you don't know the underlying tech. I didn't say it was, I'm just saying it can be done without them. Of course it can, but you don't always want to either. Why wouldn't you want to? You can save time, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Best practice patterns can be encapsulated, you know, and uh, it's the don't, don't repeat yourself principle that we've already heard mentioned a couple of times tonight. So people can come up with their own, you know, custom kind of implementations, and they they frequently do. That's still faster than a React JS app, according to Mr. The. Um, and I did notice actually that Chris was that using a, a, a timer or a web socket? Where's Chris? Is he still here? That was Firebase. Firebase. Google bought that Firebase. Um, okay, so there was real-time updating, and I noticed that in the beginning it was like Angular 2 was right at the top. I was like, are people really using Angular 2? Like, how many people here are actually using Angular 2? Seven, it was on my count. I know, but I want to, come on. Yeah, okay, there's only three people putting their hands up. Like, what's going on here? Then the other thing, like... Commercially, ask that question. Okay, how many people are using it commercially? Like, you have to use it. Okay, less. 
the three people put their hands up, two people using it commercially, and there were like seven people who, seven votes, sorry. But then I noticed later it went to jQuery, was like right at the very top, which pretty much maps the whole thing, right? Early adopters in there with Angular 2, they got their phone straight out, like, wow, this is cool, let me try this. And the jQuery guys are kind of like, oh yeah, hang on, like, well, how do I get there? Um, they, they get there eventually. Uh, React and Angular are the home of car. The homegrown framework is a skateboard. Don't choose to drive a car on a half pipe. <laughs> I'm not really sure what that means. We're starting to get a bit metaphorical on me. And yet many of the design agencies prefer to roll their own. We advocate community. They want it in-house. Now this is a real interesting point here because, you know, the Technology frameworks and libraries are about communities and they're as much about e economics as they are about technology. This is Jan Henning Thorson who said, I think it's fine to build something new, but if it's a framework, then open source it so you won't have to do all the maintenance in-house. And if you can't build a community, it's probably not that good. Why all they mean 98% of you don't have to do all of it, but you have to do 98%. 98%, yeah. 2% of it can get done outside. Uh, interesting apocryphal story here. Um, I can tell this without breaching any kind of confidentiality. I have literally hundreds of conversations with software developers and dev managers across Brisbane uh, every week. So I get a call and the guy says to me, hey look, a um, bit of a tricky one for you. I need you to find me someone who's really good with Laravel because we've got a customer who has this website that's been abandoned. We now have to take care of it. It's in Laravel. We don't know anything about Laravel. We want you to find us someone who can spend the next three months converting it to pure PHP code. I'm like, okay. <laughs> yep, that's a bit of a tough one. So you want me to find someone who's like really, really knows Laravel really well and hates it. <laughs> He's like, no, they don't have to hate it. We found the guy anyway. The guy says to me, Hey look man, in three months I can probably teach these guys how to use Laravel and it's going to be better than just using pure PHP. But of course for these guys, because they're a consultancy, they're going to go into one place where they're using Drupal, another one where they're using Joomla, another one where they're using Laravel, another one where they're using Symfony, and they're like, man, we can't learn all of these frameworks, we've got to just focus in on a couple and pure PHP is like the baseline level. That's the easiest thing to maintain. So, you know, when you're building something, as an individual developer, you might choose the thing that you like the most, or the one that excites you the most, or the one that's you know the best for whatever technical reasons you have. As a dev manager or someone choosing to build a team, one of the considerations is, can I hire people who actually know how to do this thing, or am I going to have one genius guy who's going to write the whole thing in some custom framework that no one else knows, and then when he leaves, I'm like up a creek without a paddle. So those are some of the kind of considerations around it. Here's a picture of a hipster. Um, on, a, on a train. I'm not sure who that's supposed to represent. You can make your own interpretation. So anyway, I, I left that conversation cool. like in an existential crisis and I wandered around the city until early in the morning and I found myself at about 1.30 in the morning on Victoria Bridge asking for the essential questions in life. So I of course turned to Siri because during the conversation, Maurice had told me there was some kind of statistical correlation between people who use Apple products and people who use frameworks like React and Angular. Um, I use React, I don't use Angular, but I do have a phone, so I asked Siri, is JavaScript the best programming language in the world? She thinks it's an interesting question. So I asked her what she thought of ES6. I really couldn't say. <laughs> And so I asked her what she thought about JavaScript, and all she had to say was, I think therefore I am, but let's not put Descartes before the horse. So no answers to be found there. Here's a guy listening to uh, a record. Um, I should have, I wish I had this picture. Okay, I'm downstairs in my apartment building, and someone's put a sign up, and they're saying, for sale, um, an, a CD collection. And they're like, are you sick of hearing you know, MP3s? Do you miss the warmth of CD? <laughs> <laughs> Too soon. <laughs> uh, so I turned to the, to the source, to Brendan Eich. Now did you know that Brendan Eich actually got a free trip from Silicon Graphics when he was working on the SGI kernel to come to Brisbane to fix a, a kernel error that was happening. It was an edge case in a cluster in a mining company in Brisbane. Who knows who that mining company was? Anyone? 
Yeah, I read in this book called Coders at Work. It's 15 interviews with different coders, like real old school guys, Douglas Crockford, Brendan Eich, a bunch of others, the guy who invented LiveJournal, MemcacheD. And in there, Brendan mentioned it. I was like, wow, that's amazing. So I just tweeted out, anyone know where at Brendan Eich came to in Brisbane? And he tweeted me back about five minutes later and said, Mincom. <laughs> so that kind of, that's how our relationships sort of started. And now I just, whenever I have a question about JavaScript, you know, it starts me. So anyway, I asked him, how are you feeling about year six these days? I was like, oh my God, I'm going to give this talk on Monday night. And this is like, what, Saturday? <laughs> Saturday afternoon. Brendan, what do you think about it? He says, good to have it almost done in implementations. Brendan, is it the ES4 in 2016 terms that you hope for in terms of direction? He said, it's better. ES4 was unfinished for one thing. So then I asked another question. It's not really about the async await that we were talking about in the, uh, in, in the pub, but I asked him about this question. Oh, where'd it go? It's behind it. Let me do this. How'd that happen? Uh, okay. And this one, delete that. <laughs> 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 this one, delete that one. Okay, here we go. This is what happens when you put your... Um, <laughs> it's a it's a horse. Exactly. Uh, so I asked him, what's your perspective on putting class syntax over the prototypal object composition model? This has been one of the big uh, sort of controversies around ES6 is that one of the things that they've done in ES6 is that they're, they're trying to make the language more accessible to uh, you know, programmers coming to JavaScript. And a lot of them are coming up the stack from you know, object-oriented programming languages like Java and .NET. Now, JavaScript is not an object-oriented programming language in the same sense that languages like Java and C Sharp are. It's instead based on prototypal inheritance, and the pattern that you use there generally is object composition. And of course, Martin Fowler in his famous design patterns book, The Gang of Four, said, favor object composition over prototypal, uh, sorry, over inheritance, classical inheritance. And that might go right past you, but these are the kind of um, things that you can look up later on the internet. So that's what I always do. Stack Overflow is great for that. Um, so I asked him about that. What's your perspective on putting the class syntax over? So with ES6, one of the goals for it is to make it easier and faster for people to do development and to reuse kind of patterns that they're used to and not have to learn new kind of paradigms. So there was a big controversy about this. And uh, well, this is what Brendan said to me. He sent me back this this tweet, which has this guy, Alan Werfs, Brock, who, who gave a talk and he's published the video of the talk. So you can get all of these tweets, they're all in my uh, tweet stream, so if you follow me on Twitter, you can go back and find them there from Saturday. And then there's a whole back and forth between these guys um, on Twitter. And probably the biggest critic of the class kind of syntax, syntactic sugar that's been added in ES6 is none other than Eric Elliott, who is the Karl Marx of JavaScript. He's like smash class, like he's totally against class. And I'll tell you, when I was, when I was, when I was putting this together, I looked across the room and I saw Joshua Donnelly sitting in the corner and I was like, oh my god, Eric Elliott has come to my talk. But no, he just uh, looks similar. Plain old functions, <laughs> yep. Rocking it old school, the ES3. Um, okay. So here's kind of like the evolution of JavaScript, and like we're running a bit over time, so I'm not going to have too much of a chance to go into this, but I did have my live coding here to show you guys. Um, but you can put this together yourself. I'll give you a link where you can have a look at it. So this is the evolution of coding. You've got your, your callbacks, which were your standard kind of pattern of doing things, passing callbacks. Now in ES6, you've got generators, generator yield. <clears throat> um, you've got promises. Uh, using Bluebird and now natively in ES6. And then in ES7, you've got async await. Async await. Yeah. So did that just go <coughs> between generator and async await? Yeah, so generators and you've got async await. <coughs> so I'll show you all of these running. Um, I just installed Metalsmith to do my static. So you got uh, callback was the first one, node callback, node uh, generator. 
and then no promise. They all give exactly the same output. It's just the kind of patterns that you use to construct it in the way that you think about it. I'll give you the link so that you can find the, where all of these examples are. And then for the last one, which is the async await example, it won't run in Node, and I'm running Node version 530 at the moment. So the way you can do this is you've got to compile it or transpile it using Babel. So I transpile it. I get my transpiled code, and I can run that. ES5. I get the same answer. So it's transpiled it down to ES5 code. Um, here's the transpiled code. Now, one of the issues with using transpiled code is that when you run into kind of, now you can take your photo, like um, Shakir was saying, you can take a photo and do nothing with it. Um, one of the issues with transpiled code is that when you get errors in the code, when it runs, it's not the code that you actually wrote. So it's like, well, how do I figure out where it actually went wrong? So you can use source maps for that, which will link you to where the error occurred in your, your original code that you wrote. So it's transpiled. But async await basically allows you to write what looks like synchronous code. And if you can see this on the screen here, um, the way it works in ES7 is, in, in, in the, you know, the spec, the, the proposed spec, is you put async in front of your function, and then inside that function you can call await. And what await does is, it's essentially the same thing as doing get user, user ID, and passing in a callback, and then all of the code that comes after that is inside the callback. And then you can do that multiple times. So there's no like callback nesting, there's no indentation. Like here's what it looks like with the callback. You can see here you do get user, you got user ID, you got your callback in there. It's gonna save node. It's gonna yeah. save node. Yeah. And then so here's what it looks like here. It's just it's it's effectively the same thing, but it's like a syntactic shorthand and it just makes your code easier to, to write and easier to reason about, at least when you're you know when you're writing it. So this is Spe this is in the spec for ES7, proposed for ES7, so it's not available natively at the moment, but you can use um, Babel to do transpilation. Or, last word goes to Maurice Butler, you could just use a function callback. Is that what that says? <laughs> That's not exactly what he said, but something like that. <laughs> so there you go. That's uh, yes. a little bit about the uh, ES7 teaching the controversy, because ES6 is so last month. Thank you.